Welcome back everyone. Today is last lecture on eigenstate thermalization hypothesis in QFTs. Over to you, Shavit. Okay, <clears throat> so thanks. Um, so today is the last lecture. So probably everyone is quite exhausted by now. It's the 10th day of this uh, uh, school. Uh, so what I'm going to do today is to uh, <clears throat> discuss about uh, uh, eigenstate thermalization in 2D CFTs. And uh, this will be in the light of uh, uh, the ideas which I introduced in the previous lectures and then see to what extent the, mm, uh, the general rules which we found for ETH, to what extent those hold true for 2D CFTs. <clears throat> so uh, just a summary from yesterday, and uh, these are the things uh, which would be good to keep in mind during today's lecture. So um, <clears throat> we discussed the ETH ansatz for matrix elements, which uh, essentially says that the diagonal matrix elements gives the microcanonical expectation value, and these diagonal elements are smooth, and the off-diagonal elements encode the fluctuations, and these are suppressed, okay? And yesterday we saw some examples, <clears throat> um, namely we saw that in uh, chaotic systems, like if you have uh, integrability breaking terms in your Hamiltonian, um, you can explicitly find the diagonal matrix elements and uh, they form a smooth curve, which says that you have got smooth diagonal elements. And um, we also uh, looked at some other ways uh, by which one can uh, see the, um, um, how the eigenstate thermalization works. And it can be viewed as a consequence of agreement of reduced density matrices. And one way to see that is to see an agreement of uh, entanglement entropy. And we saw that for subsystem sizes up to half the full system size, the entanglement entropy uh, of a thermal state uh, agrees with that of an excited state okay? in some spin system. And we discussed a little bit about integrable systems uh, with, we also uh, saw this experiment, which was done using rubidium atoms for, of the quantum Newton's cradle. And um, so this uh, went, uh, this had periodic oscillations and the memory of the initial state um, uh, did not get erased. And uh, we discussed that an um, appropriate way to to describe, to macroscopically describe the final state uh, is via the generalized Gibbs ensemble in which we turn on uh, chemical potentials uh, corresponding to the conserved charges. Okay. Um, okay, so that's the summary. Uh, so today we are going to discuss <coughs> thermalization in 2D CFTs. And we also discussed this idea of typicality in 2D CFT, and, <clears throat> uh, so which is the idea that not all states can obey ETH, but some uh, typical states or most states uh, <clears throat> will obey ETH. And uh, we are going to discuss this in 2D CFTs. And uh, we're also going to look at diagonal as well as off diagonal elements of some probe operators. And this will be very much uh, uh, related to the heavy, heavy light, light regime, which uh, Surbhi talked out in, uh, talked in our lectures. And yeah, so that's, that's what we did. Okay, so let's begin. Um, <clears throat> so I, I mentioned before that uh, this process of thermalization in, in a conformal field theory in which you have, you take some local operator and see how it behaves as a function of time. So init uh, initially it undergoes some erratic profile and uh, at later times it stabilizes close to the thermal expectation value, okay? And so this process of thermalization is, can be mapped to the process of gravitational collapse in, in ADS. I mean, if you have, some collapsing shell of dust, uh, it collapses under its own weight to form a black hole. Uh, uh, it can be seen that the, this process is actually equivalent to this. So um, the final temperature of this state, um, <clears throat> this has got a temperature and you can associate the Hawking temperature of the black hole uh, to this final state. 
Okay, so again, just a reminder about rational and irrational CFTs. <clears throat> uh, uh, we discussed that the symmetry algebra of the CFT is generated by the Virasoro algebra, but as Surbi uh, discussed, there, are all, there can be also higher spin conserved currents. There can be additional <clears throat> conserved currents. And um, we say that the rational CFTs are those CFTs <clears throat> in which the central charge is less than, so it's less than or equal to the number of conserved currents. So this is an <clears throat> integrable in some sense um, because uh, the number of degrees of freedom, uh, which is uh, sort of measured by the central charge is lesser than the number of conserved quantities. And the irrational CFTs uh, lie in the complementary regime where the central charge is greater than the number of conserved currents. So here we are going to, in today's lecture, we are going to uh, discuss um, Virasoro CFTs. So only the stress tensor is conserved. Okay. And um, so the central charge is going to be one. So we'll be in this irrational regime and we're going to discuss uh, irrational CFTs. And there is a possibility of uh, chaos in rational CFTs uh, because, uh, uh, yeah, it's because the, the number of degrees of freedom are larger than the conserved quantities. And the rational CFTs, they are super integrable or integrable because the number of conserved quantities is lesser than or equal to the number of conserved quantities. Yes, Orgo. Hi, Shovik. Probably it's a trivial question, but uh, so as I have uh, read that uh, this, if you have a rational CFT, the number of primaries are finite. So exactly. can, can one see it directly from this? Uh, I mean, there, is there any direct argument from here? The central charge less than the number of current, concept current will give you a finite number of primaries. Is there any direct way to see? Yes, so uh, there is no direct way to see from here itself. But this is going to play a role. So that's it. The way uh, it, it works out is from modular invariance. Okay, so uh, one needs to look at uh, one expresses the uh, partition function, and uh, mm -hmm. you can express it as a sum over uh, primaries. So just like mm -hmm. the conforming block um, expansion can be expressed as a sum over primaries, one can also express the uh, partition function as a sum over primaries. And the analog of conformal blocks that enters over here are the characters um, right. corresponding to the primary. Okay. Right. So, so for example, if I'm uh, talking about, let's say, Weiss Domino Witten kind of models, yeah, so yeah. there is a guarantee that central charge is always, I mean, this, this thing, I mean, the reverse is also true, right? I mean, yeah. So uh, let, let me let me go on. Yeah. So one can use this and then <clears throat> for C greater than one CFTs, this, um, uh, this, this character it takes an universal form okay mm -hmm. so it uh, takes the form uh, let me not write the vacuum character but let me write the character for non-trivial primaries so it takes this form c minus one by 24 divided by the Dedekind theta function okay. okay now you can use this <clears throat> and uh, demand that your partition function should be modular invariant mm -hmm. okay and then mm -hmm. you'll see that the density of primary states the density of primary states that actually grows as, uh, as e to the power uh, c minus one by probably some number um, times hp, okay? So this happens for c greater than one only, where your uh, <clears throat> uh, character is given by this. On the other hand, if your uh, CFT is rational, it has got null states. And in that case, yet the character is not given by this. So the argument works only if the character is given by this, there are no null states and you wow. use this form and demand modular invariance. And then you will see that the number of primaries grows exponentially as you increase the energy. So this thing does not happen in a rational CFT. For example, minimal models, you can look at the Ising model, it has just got three primaries. Right. Okay. So, so that's, that's the thing, that's the way it works. Okay, thanks. thanks. Okay, so yeah, so uh, I, uh, thanks for the question. This is going to play a little role uh, later on during the lectures. So uh, in a C greater than one CFT, which is an irrational CFT, the number of primaries, um, it grows exponentially. Okay, so uh, we know that the stress tensor is, is a conserved quantity. 
But there are also additional conserved currents, I mean, which you can uh, build out of the stress tensor, and these are actually independent. Um, so, um, so 2D CFTs, uh, even just with Virasoro symmetry, they have an infinite number of mutually commuting and conserved charges. So the commutator is zero, and they also commute with the, with the Hamiltonian, so they are conserved. So the first, so the, these go under the name of uh, KDV charges because they're related to symmetries of the KDV equation. So the first uh, conserved charge in this hierarchy is the stress tensor itself. And we learned about normal ordering in the lecture on CFT. Uh, the second one is given by the normal ordered uh, product, the quadratic combination of the stress tensor. And the third one is given by the cubic combination minus some uh, thing which is constructed out of the derivative of the stress tensor and so on. So uh, these things are actually fixed uh, order by order if you demand conservation and uh, mutual commutativity, okay? Uh, so um, yeah, but it's really, it gets really hard to work these out as you go to like higher numbers, so T8, um, or say uh, T10, it might take T, T8 or T10 might take one page, uh, one A4 page to write down. Okay, so it gets quite complicated. But anyway, there is some systematic way to find these up. Um, and um, so I these are the charges and one can also see what the zero modes corresponding to the charge is. So the first zero mode is um, is the is the Hamiltonian itself. So this is just the L zero, okay. And the second one, it has got this quadratic combination of the modes and the uh, plus some uh, constant terms. And the third Hi, one. Sophie, uh, there is a question by Nitu yeah. in the chat. Uh, is there a specific reason for denoting these charges by even labels two, four, six? Uh, yes. So uh, yes. It, it, can be seen yes so so the reason is 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 as follows because the you can associate a conformal dimension to these charges and um uh, the conformal dimension is actually yeah goes as two, two four and six yeah yeah but uh, sorry about the notation over here i've used something odd but uh, i hope <laughs> sorry about that so uh, this is uh, this is actually related to uh, uh, the previous slide. Yeah. This is actually related to T two, the first one, and then uh, this is related to uh, my iPad does not work here. So. Yeah. So the first one is related to T two. Uh, the second one is related to T four. This one is related to T six, and so on. Yeah, so that's related to the conformal dimension. Of this. So the stress tensor is dimension two. Over here, you can see that the, it has got a quadratic combination of the stress tensor modes. So this is dimension four, this is dimension six, and so on. Okay, so one can write uh, the zero modes of these uh, conserved charges uh, in this way. So the details are not very important. I mean, if you, it's, uh, the, you don't need to remember what the right hand side is. Okay, uh, so just another reminder that the states in our CFT, they are classified by um, the symmetries, which is this Virasoro algebra. And we saw that um, it can be organized into uh, primaries, which are the highest weight states and excitations built on top of them, which are the descendants. So we take a primary state and then we act it by a bunch of stress tensor modes and we create this descendants, okay? And this uh, first one is a descendant at level one and second one is a descendant at level two and so on. And the growth of the number of descendants uh, with the level, uh, it grows as the hardy ramanujan formula because at a given level, there are, are an, an integer partitions worth, worth of descendants, okay? Okay, so now uh, let's come to thermalization. So we just saw that uh, 2D CFTs, they have an infinite number of conserved quantities. So these are the KDV charges. And yet via the ADS CFT correspondence, we expect that the dual CFTs, they should thermalize because uh, we do have black holes um, that exist in the gravity dual. Okay, so in ADS3, you have got the BTZ black hole. 
So uh, this presents a tension that, I mean, in a sense that this is an integrable theory, right? But at the same time, we expect it to thermalize. So um, how can we resolve this puzzle? And since we learned about ETH, which was a strong criteria for a quantum system to thermalize, one question we would like to ask is that, is the ETH ansatz for matrix elements obeyed? And since we are dealing with an integrable system, um, uh, it's, it is reasonable to expect that the generalized Gibbs ensemble in which you have chemical potentials turned on for all the conserved quantities, uh, this generalized ensemble is going to play a role in some way. Okay, so that's the questions we would like to address. Okay, so um, uh, we are interested in, in, in verifying something of this kind, that whether the, the expectation value in a thermal state, uh, whether it agrees with the expectation value in a, a sufficiently highly excited state. Okay, and at large central charge, um, it was shown uh, by this work of Fitzpatrick, Kaplan and Walters that um, heavy primary states, um, um, actually they reproduce uh, uh, thermal correlation functions of light operators. Okay, so um, this can be shown that uh, you look at, so the left-hand side is, is a thermal state. So you can calculate the two-point function of two light operators in a thermal state. Okay, so this is something uh, uh, which uh, I discussed in the first lecture and Surbi also discussed. So this takes this form of uh, 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 beta by pi, uh, cinch uh, uh, pi x1, x2, x1, 2 by beta to the power hl, 4 hl. Okay, so that's fixed by conformal invariance and by using the conformal map to go from the plane to the thermal spin. That. And on the right hand side, um, we have a correlation function. This is a four point correlation function because we have two light operators and we have two heavy operators. So these ones, they sit at infinity and at zero. Okay. So you need to compute this four point correlation function. And um, as Surbi discussed, you can use conformal blocks. Uh, so uh, you can use the conformal block blocks and then um, in some suitable regime for a holographic theory, you can use uh, approximate this by the identity block and you use the heavy, heavy light light block because you have got two heavy operators and two light operators. And you use those blocks and, um, and at large central charge, they can be calculated and that agrees with this, okay? So, uh, mm, so assuming vacuum dominance, which is if you work with the identi identity block, and uh, so uh, you can show that these two things actually agree, okay? Not everything is going to agree because um, uh, um, this operator uh, is, is, this quantity is a thermal mm, correlation function. So it should obey the KMS condition that it should be periodic under, uh, um, time translations uh, with, uh, with t uh, going to uh, t plus beta. But uh, whereas this is a, a single state, excited state correlator, and it is not going to obey the TMS condition. Okay, but um, you can look at sufficiently small separations uh, and uh, it agrees. Okay, so that's, that's, uh, that's it. Okay, so uh, one might think that, okay, so primary operators are a good description, so they can form excited states and <clears throat> these can be, um, these can obey ETH. Okay. And um, actually um, um, there was also a check of entanglement entropy. So one can again use the um, um, heavy, heavy light light block in order to calculate the entanglement entropy. So in 2D CFT, uh, I don't know whether Jotin my already talked about this or not. You can calculate the entanglement entropy using twist operators. So you do this replica trick and you can implement the replica trick using twist operators. Now, uh, these twist operators actually become light operators when you take the n going to one limit of the replica trick. And again, you can use the heavy, heavy light, light uh, uh, approximation over there. And um, you can actually use that to compute the entanglement entropy. 
And then you can compare the entanglement entropy of a pure state, which is this uh, green curve over here, okay, and that of a thermal state, and it shows agreement um, up to uh, system uh, subsystem sizes of uh, which are half the full system size. Okay, so and it goes back down because it is a pure state, so it should obey the relation that S A is equal to S A. equal to S A complement. And that's the reason it goes back down, okay, for the pure state. Whereas for the thermal state, it keeps increasing. Okay, so this gives um, um, uh, reasonable evidence that, you know, sufficiently highly excited states, which are created by primary operators, they can reproduce thermal features. Okay, so any questions up to this stage? Yeah, and then before I move on. All right, all right. Okay, so um, uh, so we would like to now um, uh, verify this even further. So, um, so these correlators and entanglement entropy, which I showed in the previous slides, um, they use this identity block approximation and those calculations were also at large central charge. So, uh, but can one do a slightly more honest calculation and then try to verify uh, without these approximations and try to verify whether primary states can reproduce uh, uh, the thermal state results, okay? So um, uh, we, we would like to use uh, stress tensor correlators as, as probes. So these are more constrained. Uh, these are constrained by uh, conformal symmetry or the Virasoro symmetry in a 2D CFT. So this sector is very universal in a 2D CFT, okay? And um, so one can do a comparison of uh, the stress tensor in, in, in a thermal state, which is this, and um, some uh, endpoint function of stress tensors in, in a highly excited state, okay? So that's, that's what uh, we are interested in verifying. So this is like the diagonal uh, part of the ETH matrix uh, with uh, the stress tensor, with a string of stress tensors as our probe operator. Right, so that's that's what we want to check first. Okay, so now uh, there was some evidence from entanglement entropy and from the heavy, heavy light, light correlator that um, there is a chance that uh, the uh, 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 that that primary states can show ETH. Okay, so um, one can uh, let's let's try to do this first. So, um, so one can uh, compare the expectation value of the Hamiltonian, so which is nothing but the one point function of the stress tensor in a thermal state and uh, the one point function of the stress tensor in the uh, primary state, okay? You can compare these two things. And uh, HP is large because it's a heavy state. Okay, and in that regime, uh, uh, you can arrive at this relation. So recall that the notion of temperature arises by comparing uh, the expectation value of the Hamiltonian itself. Okay? And that's exactly what is being done. Okay? Okay? And then, then from there, you can relate the inverse temperature to the conformal dimension of the primary. All right. So that we have this relation. Now, um, one can use uh, conformal symmetries and um, in particular ward identities uh, to find the higher point correlation functions of, uh, you can find the higher point, uh, say the two point function. Uh, uh, yes, or please. Uh, uh, Shabik, when you write this HP by L square, this, uh, I mean, it, which primary are we talking about? P at, I mean, HP. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, so I'm just talking about a primary HP, okay? If you look at the L0 eigenvalue of this, this gives HP. So HP is being used as a label, but it is the L0 eigenvalue. Uh, but uh, you can have any primaries, right? I mean, the, it can be any primary. Let's say you have in yeah, theory, so you have the only, only restriction which I'm making over here is that the HP goes to infinity. Yeah. The, the, okay. So, yes. so is it, I mean, my question is that if you start with a uh, CFT, then is it a particular um, primary or is- Yeah, yeah. So, so you pick a particular CFT, you fix the central charge. 
Okay. Right. P is greater than one, but we make uh, we demand that H P is very much greater than C. Okay. Okay. So it's a heavy primer. Okay, it's a heavy primer. Yeah. Yeah. Or a high energy primer. Okay. Uh, yeah. All right. So that's the one point function. Uh, this is the one point function. You can also find the two point function. Yeah, using conformal symmetries. Okay, so the two point function in the thermal state, it uh, takes this form. Okay. And the two point function in the uh, heavy primary state, it takes this form. Okay, so I've already used this relation to write this down. So, init so initially, you'll get an answer which is a function of HP. And then you, you use this identification of HP with the temperature uh, to get this relation. Is this clear? Okay, so uh, so the one comparison of the one point function gave you this, but uh, the two point function turns out to be this and this. Okay, so let's uh, look at this in a little bit detail. So we see that at large central charge, uh, it's sufficient to just consider this term and this term. Okay, um, so uh, and it agrees. So this term it agrees. Right, so at large central charge, you see do see agreement, but um, at, 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 if you keep the central charge to be finite, you should also keep track of the subleading term, but the subleading term actually does not agree. Okay, so uh, it has got the same short distance behavior, but uh, which is just uh, this term. This term is the OPE singularity. It has got the same short distance behavior, but uh, in general, it, it does not agree. Okay, so it's a, it's a problem. So, I mean, uh, what happens at finite central charge? Uh, and in gravity, um, um, one should keep track of one over C corrections. These correspond to quantum or graviton loop corrections in, in ADS. So if you're interested in the theory of quantum gravity, uh, you should also keep track of uh, uh, finite C corrections. Okay, so it's uh, not just large N. Uh, so yeah, large N is just the classical regime, but one would also like to understand what is beyond that regime as well. Okay, so uh, we saw that there is this disagreement. All right, and the reason behind this disagreement is that primaries are not typical states. So these are very special states actually. So uh, let's discuss this a little bit. So um, recall that in CFT that your, um, uh, your states are primaries and excitations built on top of them, uh, which are these descending states. So these green dots are primaries and these violet dots are descendants. Now the density of all states, this is the Cardi formula, okay? The density of all states is given by this, all right? Where H is the energy of the state. Uh, you can derive an analogous Cardi formula for the density of primary states. So this is just, this was my response to Orgo's question that uh, why do we have an infinite number of primaries in irrational CFTs, okay? One can uh, see actually derive, one can actually derive how the number of primaries, they grow. How do they grow uh, with energies, okay? And that also grows exponentially, but instead of the Cardi formula where you have C, you have C minus one over here, okay? So you see that at large central charge, these two formulas are essentially the same, okay? This formula and this formula is essentially the same at large central charge. So primaries are typical states at large central charge and they do indeed reproduce the expectation value. But if you keep the central charge to be finite, then you have to keep track of one over C corrections. And then what this says is that there is an exponentially large number of other states compared to the primaries. And as we know that there are only two kinds of states in CFTs, they're just primaries and descendants. So a typical state, which is like exponentially larger than the number of it is exponentially larger compared to the number of primaries, a typical state has to be a descendant state. It's not a primary state, okay? So primaries are highly atypical. The growth is exponentially smaller uh, compared to the, so the growth of primary states, uh, it's exponentially smaller compared to the growth of uh, 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 all states. Okay. Yes, Rohit. 
Yeah, uh, by typical states, do you mean states uh, which uh, gave, uh, uh, which follow the typicality principle? I mean, uh, yes, it followed the typicality principle, and hopefully, if we if we go back uh, to the previous slide. Uh, uh, And hopefully, I mean, if, if we work, we, if we make the correct identification of what are the typical states, then it should restore the agreement between these coordinates. Yeah, so they will be close to thermal state, right? Yes, exactly. So they will be close to the thermal state. So the, if you can look at the mean um, of, the, uh, of, 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 an, of an observable like this, you can also look at the variance. And if the variance is small, then it's sharply peaked about the mean. So that, it's, that means that uh, most states uh, or typical states uh, might be able to reproduce uh, this thermal result. Okay, so that, that, that's what I mean, yeah. Okay. yeah. So uh, another way to say this is that, you know, primaries are, have got, uh, it's like a, a very symmetric points in the sense that they, these are highest weight states, but um, that's good from a, uh, like a classifying states point of view. But if you look at, the full Hilbert space of your theories, um, most of these states are not highest weight states. I mean, these are like uh, excitations on top of these highest weight states. Yeah. Okay. Any questions up to this point? Uh, can, uh, yeah, I just want to understand that uh, at large C, then we have uh, all yeah. the primaries are. We only have the typical states, which are the primaries, and yes. then the agreement to uh, yes. thermal expectation value holds. Yes. So how does it reconcile with what we said in this first slide that we are starting with an integrable CFT, and mm -hmm. then now we have something which agrees with the thermal expectation value? Right, right, right. So the idea is that, I mean, this can also be seen in lattice systems that you can, you can find typical states um, uh, and these typical states can also uh, reproduce thermal expectation values even in integrable systems. Uh, okay. okay. And the reason why that happens is that, um, but yesterday I said that one can generalize the ETH ansatz in an integrable system if you restrict to a small window of energies, but not only within a small window of energies but also within a small window of additional conserved charges. And these typical states, they have the, these additional conserved charges to be very close to each other. And that's why yeah, you can restore this agreement. Okay. Okay. Uh, so let's try to make these ideas precise. Um, so we saw that the um, uh, so let's consider a state at, at uh, uh, descend that the tip, uh, we saw that the a typical state uh, is a descendant state. Now let's consider uh, a state, uh, a descendant state at level n. Okay, so this is at level n. So this is primary of at level zero. Okay, and uh, a descendant at level n. So the total energy is. Um, mm, uh, is, is given by, by the uh, conformal dimension plus the additional excitation on top of it, okay? So this is the descendant level uh, plus the conformal dimension. And that's the energy of, uh, of a descendant of level N, all right? So uh, this, I hope this is clear. Now the growth of primaries, as I said, this can be found from modular invariance. Uh, this is given by uh, a version of the Cardius formula. Uh, and it's given by this, with this uh, C minus one. Okay. Now the growth of descendants, this is essentially the growth of the number of partitions. Okay. So you fix a, a given CFT Werner module and at a given descendant level, if, you, if it's high enough, then it's uh, given by uh, uh, the Hardy-Ramanujan formula. Okay. The Hardy-Ramanujan formula gives you the growth of partitions for large integers. Okay, so let's combine these two things. Okay, so, um, um, so the growth of the total number of states is going to be a product. So it's the growth at high energies. We are interested in high energies. So it's going to be a product of the growth of primaries and uh, uh, the, the growth of descendants within a single uh, Verma module. 
right? So it's just the product of this and this. Okay, so uh, that's a growth total number of uh, growth of the total number of states. Now uh, note that uh, so this h minus h p is essentially uh, your descendant level n. So it could just come follows from this equation. Okay. So this is just uh, p of n, and it's given by the hard function. Okay, so now note that we would like to uh, fix the total energy. So that's what ETH says. You like uh, create a state. I mean, it has got a fixed energy, and that is H. Okay, so this H is actually fixed. So the only uh, variable parameter is is HP. It's 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 the conformal dimension of the primary state. So the variable parameter is HP. So uh, in order to find uh, what are the typical states, uh, there is one free parameter, which is HP, and we would like to maximize uh, this entropy. I mean, e to, uh, this is like e to the s, and uh, we would like to maximize with respect to the free parameter, right? So that is give, going to give you the typical states. And uh, you take these formulas, uh, you take these formulas, and then you maximize uh, this product, uh, you try to maximize this product. And what you'll see is that you'll get this relation, that the total energy is related to the conformal dimension of the primary in this way, okay? Once again, if you see at large central charge, this uh, prefactor actually becomes one and H is equal to HP, you get back the primary, all right? Uh, but this, um, you can just simply rewrite it as HP plus HP divided by C plus one, okay? It's just you know, if you just add these two things, you just get this. Okay, so what this says is that you know, there is this contribution to the energy from the primary state, which is this, plus there is this additional contribution. This is the descendant level, this is N, okay? Okay, so uh, this defines for you what the typical state is. It is, it is, a, prime, it is a descendant state uh, that descends from a primary of, 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 of conformal weight HP, and it is at level HP divided by C plus one. Okay, so that's, that's, the, uh, that's, that's how you identify the typical state in the PDC. Okay, you can make, we'll make this even further precise because once we have specified the descendant level, it does not, um, uh, and so this is, this is a descendant at level N and at level N there, is, there are, and um, there are, you know, there are, you look at the number of integer partitions of level N. Okay, so there can be many possibilities at, at, of descendants at level N, level N. Okay, so we also have to specify that. So what is the specific integer partition corresponding to this descendant level? Okay, so that's something additional, which is yet to be specified. Okay, so uh, uh, that can actually be done. And uh, uh, the way that works is, and I mean, finally, what you have is that, okay, so uh, we identified, uh, so we saw that H divided by L squared is equal to, I forgot what is the exact relation. It was C by beta squared up to some factors of pi and so on, um, pi and 24 and so on. So, uh, and then uh, the, uh, if you add these two things, uh, essentially HP plus M, yeah, let me be more precise. So it's going to be C L squared divided by 24 beta squared. So this comes by comparing uh, the one point function of the stress tensor in the thermal state and um, the one point function in this uh, descendant state. Okay, you get this relation. And then um, uh, since we saw in the previous slide that the total energy is HP plus HP divided by C plus one, this is the descendant level, let's call it M. Okay, so then the energy gets distributed to the, to the primary conformal dimension in this way. Then there is this additional uh, contribution to the energy coming from the descendants. So if you just add these two things, uh, you get this back. Okay, and um, I said that we also have to specify the uh, the integer partition corresponding to this descendant level, and that's actually Boltzmann distributed uh, with a Bose-Einstein mean. 
Okay, so these numbers, uh, which add up to M, okay, these are Boltzmann distributed uh, with a Bose Einstein mean. So these are, uh, this comes from standard statistical reasoning, um, but this defines for you very precisely what this typical state is. Okay, let, let me give you some intuition about, uh, about what, where, the, where this uh, typical partition of integers actually comes from. Um, okay, so let me clear this. Okay, so uh, there is, um, uh, you can look, uh, so these numbers over here, so they, they essentially give you the descendant level. Okay, so the, if you add these two numbers, these numbers like one plus, uh, times n1 plus two times n2 plus three times n3, it essentially gives you the descendant level m, all right? Now the descendant level is, is, is equivalent so therefore to partitioning of an uh, integer m, okay? Now, partitions, they can actually be represented by Young diagrams. So let's look at uh, the number seven, okay? Um, so seven, you can write it as, you know, one plus one plus uh, seven times one, and that corresponds to the Young diagram, which is this, all right? So it's this, this uh, like symbolically represents one plus one plus one seven times, okay? And then uh, this Young diagram, it represents, you know, two plus one plus one, plus one uh, five times, and that gives you a total of seven. Is this clear? Like, can uh, people understand this? Okay, I see some nodding heads, which is helpful. Um, yeah, so then the next one, uh, you know, it's, it's then two plus two, uh, plus one plus one plus, so that it again gives you seven. Okay, the, then the next one is again, you know, three plus one plus one plus one, uh, which again gives you seven. Now you see that you can always relate this integer partition to a Young diagram. Now, uh, this Young diagrams um, in, have some uh, characteristic profile. If you look at this edge, okay? If you look at uh, this, this edges on the right, if you look at these edges, it's, uh, for large integers, it's something like a curve, right? You can like uh, something like this, okay? You see that, you know, it's, this is something which is actually typical. Uh, this is something which is typical, but this is something which is very atypical. And this is something which is very atypical. You know, just by visually, if you just try to look at it and see it, okay? Um, if you look at a large integer, this actually becomes clearer. Um, so you can take a very large integer, like 12,000, and look at 50 random partitions of it. And you can look at the edges of the young diagram. That's what I've done over here. So these single colored li uh, lines, which you see over here, uh, uh, which you see over here, these are edges of the Young diagram. Okay, and you can just plot them. And you, see, and you see that if you take a very large integer uh, of something around like 12,000 or even larger, then um, this has got a limiting curve. So this, there is a curve. Uh, it's, it's actually lies very close to this limiting curve actually. Okay, the, so there was some work uh, done earlier by Bershik who actually studied uh, these things. And um, this curve over here, it's exactly, it's the Bose-Einstein distribution. Okay, so people in statistical physics have also studied this. And you know, this typical curve over here is Bose-Einstein. And uh, I think there are some studies from the random matrix uh, context as well. Maybe uh, Orgo or Nito probably can say a bit more, but uh, yeah. We, we also have a work on these things, so yeah. Oh, okay, okay, yeah. So it's, uh, so the typical uh, partitions of, of, um, uh, of integers, I mean, this is, re this is related to the Bose-Einstein distribution. Okay, so uh, uh, I think that is uh, uh, some reasonable amount of, uh, yes, okay, yeah, tough question. Could you explain once more how did that partition counting go with the end diagrams? I didn't really hear. Uh, how it's related to the Young diagram? Okay, so let's take a small integer, something like, uh, something like four, okay? And then you can write it as one plus one plus one plus one. Okay, and this corresponds to like putting four boxes on top of each other, right? Okay, so next one, let's do two plus one plus one, okay? And then you put one box and then another box and then two boxes, okay? So this is another end. And then, uh, you know, you can do uh, three plus one, 
So this is like put in one box and then three boxes. Okay, is that clear? That's how you do it. Okay. You now, if you take you can also do a rearrangement thing, like take a one box, right. one box from the bottom and put it uh, beside one, and then yeah, 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 yeah. You can also do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's exactly corresponds to this plot over here. Yeah, I flipped it. Yeah. Okay. Is it clear, Akhil? Uh, yeah, kind of. Yeah, but uh, but you can go on. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Yeah, so the idea is that if you take a very large, uh, very large uh, integer, and if you look at the edge of this Young diagram, so it's going to be something like this, so, you know, some, some, some typical Young diagram, which is going to have some characteristic shape, okay? And sort of a mirror image of this uh, you know, uh, is, is plotted over here, okay? That it uh, has got this, uh, it takes this limiting shape, this curve, which is Bose Einstein. Okay, so that defines for us what is a typical state. Um, so a typical state has has got uh, its conformal dimension related to the temperature in this way. The descendant level is related to the uh, temperature in this way. And you look at a specific integer partition and the numbers uh, entering that partition uh, is Boltzmann distributed and the mean is given by the Bose-Einstein function. Okay, now you can do, uh, take this step. Um, you can work out the two-point function of the stress sensor. Uh, you can do it analytically. You can also do it numerically uh, by plugging in values. Yes, I can just uh, wait for a couple of minutes. I'll take your question. Uh, and then if you, uh, if you compute the two-point function of a thermal state and then compare it with this typical state, um, yeah, it shows remarkable agreement. So this um, uh, red dotted line is the uh, uh, that of a thermal state, and then uh, if if you do the analogous calculation for the uh, single microstate, which is this typical state, it closely it is lies very close to the uh, to the to the red line. But this is numerics. I mean, done with some finite uh, descendant level, but you can also do this analytically. And, and actually see the agreement. And uh, the reason why it is typical is that you can calculate the mean and you can also calculate the fluctuations and the fluctuations actually die out with large in the thermodynamic limit, in the large system size limit. And uh, yeah, analytically as well, uh, one can actually verify that uh, these two things agree. So, uh, so I come to an end of this part. So, we see or saw that typical states in 2D CFT, they reproduce the thermal expectation values, okay? And so the uh, details of that state, so we saw this is a high level descendant state um, with these integer partitions, and you can calculate the endpoint function of the stress tensor in a typical state and compare it with the uh, endpoint function in a thermal state, and it shows agreement. All right, now um, going back to this question about conserved charges, I mean, uh, recall that we spoke about this KDV charges. All right, so these KDV charges were defined in this way that you have some normal ordered product of stress tensors. And, but now that we have shown agreement of these correlation functions, this is a more general statement. This actually implies this KDV charges in the thermal state uh, versus uh, the KDV charge in the typical state, this actually agree. Okay, so uh, because the reason is that, you know, there's something like a normal ordered product of T is defined by point splitting and you subtract OP divergences. That's something which we learned in the uh, CFT lecture. Okay, but, and uh, the point splitting, uh, the point splitted uh, version of the operator comes from the correlation function. And once you have shown equality of the correlation function, um, you have, um, and that implies agreement of this conserved KDV charges. Okay, so all, the, um, so this, for these typical states, uh, the KDV charges really are very close to each other. I mean, one can also find the variance. I mean, it's, it's very sharply peaked at high, for, for high descendant levels, all these KDV charges are very close to each other and the variance is small. So uh, that's the description. And one final comment is that, you know, a thermal state in the CFT, um, so that's the um, canonical description. 
um, that is identified with a black hole in, in ADS. Okay? But um, one would like to go to a microscopic description, understand where the entropy is actually coming from. And one needs to identify where the microstates are. Okay? And that's the reason why, is, why one is interested in identifying um, you know, the single states can, which can reproduce thermodynamic behavior. So these typical states uh, should uh, actually be identified uh, with black holes uh, in the gravity table. Yeah, so that's all I had to say about uh, this part. Yes, Akhil, you had a question. Uh, this notation of expectation NJ given by this Boltzmann like factor, should I, should I think that it's like putting a separate capital potential for each of the L's or something? Is that? No. Okay. Okay. Se second, and like this, this class of typical states that that's that's all the typical states which contribute to the. Uh, I mean, all the states which contribute to the entropy are like yeah. of this kind. Yeah. 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 That's that's yeah. That's the thing. Yeah. Because the vast majority of states are of this kind. Yeah. You, there are other states, but there are really very few of them. Yeah. So these these reproduce whole of the entropy. Is that right? Yeah, maybe up to like up to one by C, maybe. I mean, up to C corrections, maybe. But like, do they reproduce area by four kind of scaling? Like the yes. Cardi scaling, they reproduce, right? Yes, yes, yes. Well, I mean, I should say that I mean, the, 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 so we defined a typical state very precisely using these. Okay, now. Um, it's kind of hard to say what is a typical state. I mean, and what is an act, you know, to distinguish it. I mean, visually you can clearly see that, you know, this is very atypical and, you know, this is kind of typical, all right? I mean, I've seen in computer science uh, or, in, or in, in some math literature, like they try to make this notion of typicality very precise. I mean, if one tries to do something like that, which I don't know very well, one can get what the actual uh, difference is between, say, the Bekenstein Hawking entropy and like the amount of states, the typical states uh, that give rise to the entropy. But uh, my belief is that, I mean, it is going to be really, really small. Yeah. Yeah. OK, any further questions? comments so do the random matrix experts uh, they want to say anything like you know, since you have done something similar yeah no <clears throat> i mean we haven't done something in, in this context but there's in a math there's a there's a process they call growth process where they have start with one young diagram mm -hmm. i mean and add boxes over that with some probability distribution and mm -hmm. then you can show that there's a uh, there's a limiting curve kind of thing. I mean, right, uh, right. at large number of box limit, you will get a finite curve. Okay, right. I mean, that's the most thing. And then what we have done from the matrix model side that we have shown that that kind of curve is basically in some sense a uh, saddle point. If you write a partition function mm -hmm. over those boxes, then that's a saddle point. So I think probably the, for your typical settings also, one can do something like that. I mean, if you think about contributions coming from each diagram, right. and then you turn go to a large n limit, do yeah. everything in the continuous basis and talk about what's the saddle point of that. Then probably that's the typical thing is basically the saddle point or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Something yeah. Similar. yeah. That, that, that is actually another way to think about this. So uh, you can think, uh, so this is, uh, let's see, yeah, there is actually a similar way to think about that. So, um, you know, this quantity on the right, how is it defined? It is defined as a trace of say, uh, you have some, uh, something like this. Let's just take two of these, and then e to the power minus beta. Okay, you can write this uh, as as an integral. So this is uh, nothing but an integral of dE over uh, the density of states uh, times e to the power minus beta e, and then uh, this thing. You have the two two point function t t. t. Okay, so uh, that's something like this. Now, uh, this actually, you know, the, the, the density of states, it grows, it has an, exp oops. 
So the density of states is actually has an exponential growth, okay? But the Boltzmann factor is something which is suppressed. So there's also a saddle point approximation involved over here. Okay, and that's exactly why, and the, that saddle point is exactly the typical one. Is another way to think. And relatedly, when does the saddle point approximation break down? So if you have a very large number of insertions, like if you have a very large correlation function, then the saddle point approximation is going to break down because there will be contributions from here, which is not going to allow your saddle point approximation. So a very fine grained correlation function does not obey ETH as we discussed yesterday. Okay, so uh, if it's a sufficiently small uh, few body operator, then uh, we can see uh, this agreement. Otherwise, uh, we cannot. Okay, so uh, any further questions? All right. So uh, let's go ahead. So um, we saw that the ETH ansatz is this. Um, uh, we could verify this to some extent for uh, endpoint functions of, of, of stress tensors, at least for the diagonal part. But uh, okay, so that provides a good identification for what the typical states are in your theory. Okay? But more generally, uh, one would like to understand um, uh, whether the ETH ansatz in, in, in in its entirety, whether it's obeyed or not. All right, and one more thing to keep in mind is that the stress tensor is something which is conserved, okay? It serves as a good means to identify what the typical states are, but um, in order to see some dynamical process, one would really like to understand correlation functions of non-conserved probe operators, okay? So something like a pr primary operator or a night probe operator, which is not conserved, one would like to look at the, uh, uh, matrix elements of those operators. So the question is, uh, is the ETH criterion met in 2D CFT? As I said, I mean, it's not a lemma or an axiom which has to be obeyed, but it should be checked on a case by case basis. And we are trying to do the same here for in 2D CFT. Okay, so now I come to this discussion of matrix elements in 2D CFTs. So um, uh, we saw that uh, the typical states reproduce uh, thermal expectation values for the stress tensor. And uh, while defining the typical state, any, any generic state in 2D CFT, it is labeled by the conformal dimension, its descendant level, and the partitions uh, corresponding to this descendant level. Yeah. So um, ideally, we would like to understand what is what are the matrix elements of uh, this uh, of the of an light operator O in two descendant states. Okay. So uh, there is always an overall OP coefficient. So uh, there will be some OP coefficients C, P, Q, uh, H. Okay, corresponding to these primary operators H, Q, uh, H, P, and O, H. Okay, so there will be an overall OP coefficient, so which is theory dependent information. Okay, this, this is a part of the CFT data. Okay, so this is something which is not universal, but the factors that come along with it because uh, of the presence of these descendants, those are actually universal and those are fixed uh, by Vera Soros selection. And there should be a way to, uh, to calculate these. And we can look at the structure. Uh, uh, what, 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 what is the structure of these matrix elements, All right? Uh, so there is an overall OP coefficient corresponding to these three primary operators, but we can study the matrix elements within a single Verma module. So this is like the part of the universal information about the, of, of any C greater than one CFT. Okay, so that's what we'll try to run. And actually, uh, um, these matrix elements have uh, have not quite been studied in the past. So even regardless of thermalization, it is worthwhile to study the structure of these matrix elements as, as they form a universal aspect of 2D CFTs. And uh, there's something called the oscillator formalism of the uh, Virasoro algebra, so which, which is closely related to one of the equations which Nitu wrote towards the end uh, of her lectures, 
Uh, I do not have time to discuss this, but uh, if anyone is interested, please ask me later on. Uh, but I'll just show you the results. I mean, let's see whether uh, how, what's the structure of these matrix elements are. Okay, so uh, this is a bit about the oscillator formalism, but uh, yeah, we can uh, talk about it later on. But uh, the results for the matrix elements, they actually turn out uh, to be of this form. So uh, we have to choose some parameters. So, uh, so th these matrix elements can actually be found analytically in the regime of, uh, if you have a light probe and heavy uh, external operators. So this is again, like a heavy light limit. Uh, but for more generic parameters, uh, one can also find the, these numerically. Okay, and uh, you know, yeah, we can try to see what the structure is. Okay, so what we see is that, um, let's choose uh, the central charge to be not too large, but at least larger than one. So these external states are heavy primaries, uh, like they, they are descendants of heavy primaries. So it's sufficiently large conformal dimension. And this is the probe operator dimension, which is five. So it's a light operator. So this is like the heavy light regime, okay? And what we see is that, so the darker the matrix elements, uh, so this is a matrix plot. So the darker it is, the greater value it has, and the lighter it is, the smaller it is. So this is what we see that the, that the diagonal matrix element is clearly, it has got much larger values compared to the off-diagonal matrix elements. But ETH tells you that the off-diagonal elements, I mean, it should be a random matrix. Clearly, this is not a random matrix. There is enough amount of interesting pattern over here. Um, but we see that these are actually suppressed, I mean, to, by, by some amount, okay? So uh, each of these boxes you see over here, these, so this is at level 12. Uh, so this is uh, descendants at level 12 versus uh, descendants at level 12. Um, there are partitions worth of these states. And so do you have this box over here, okay? And similarly, the, this is like the descendants at level 11 uh, um, on, on, the, on this direction and descendants of level 12 in this direction. And there is this uh, you know, rectangle which you have. Here, okay? And each of these rectangles have got some uh, structure uh, uh, within them. Okay, this actually comes from numerics, but one can do some analytics and understand uh, uh, the structure uh, analytically. As well. We'll see. Okay, so uh, so this is the um, uh, um, heavy light regime. One can go to uh, even uh, stronger heavy light regimes. You can make the uh, uh, probe operator to be of really small conformal dimension, conformal dimension one, and the external operators to be like of really high conformal dimension, like 5,000 and also large central charge if you like. And then this is the matrix plot, which you get that uh, the off diagonals they become even more suppressed, but the structure actually persists. Okay. Now uh, it's just uh, numeric, so you can just keep tuning parameters and get some designs. Uh, so uh, you can get some uh, formal shirt-like design. Um, if you uh, have, uh, instead of a light probe, you have a heavy probe, okay? So here the external operator has got the same conformal dimension as the probe operator, okay? So this is not in the heavy light region, okay? So your light, this is not a light operator. So it's not a very simple operator. It's going to, in the gravitational setup, you can think that this is beyond the probe approximation and it's back, back reacts on the geometry. So you see over here that clearly the intuit structure is lost. Okay, so, so the, there is no hierarchy uh, between the magnitude of uh, diagonal elements versus of diagonal elements. Okay, that's what we get. Um, but let's try to analyze this thing in a, a bit more detail. So let's try to look at diagonal elements first. So let's look at the diagonal elements and then let's look at a plot of the diagonal elements uh, versus the energy. So, um, uh, so this is the energy of the descendant state, okay? Um, uh, and the color of each of these, they indicate the descendant level, okay? So this is like level, uh, I don't remember, but level maybe 10, level nine, level eight and so on, okay? That's what we get from the diagonal elements. Now, uh, ETH uh, taught us that in order for the systems to thermalize, the diagonal elements should be smoothly varied. 
but uh, clearly we see some uh, uh, some outliers over here. Okay, some uh, some states which are uh, like kind of they do not overall they, these do not form a smooth curve. Okay, so some something uh, is going wrong. Um, so something is actually going wrong, and what is going wrong, and how can we possibly refine this description um, in order to allow for thermalization? Okay, so the diagonal elements are not smoothly varying, but let's try to understand this uh, a bit further. Why is this happening? So um, notice that uh, there are additional conserved charges in your system. And in order to formulate ETH for an integrable system, I mentioned that we need to look at a small window of energies as well as a small window of additional conserved charges. So when you actually look at the second uh, KDV charge, which is the second conserved charge, okay? So the stress, stress tensor around the Hamiltonian is the first one. Let's look at the second one. You'll see that uh, uh, these, the second conserved charge has got a big spread. Okay, so like there are some, some states at each descendant level whose conserved charge actually is very different from the, from the typical value, if you like. Okay, so, the, so these dots are kind of very outlier states. Okay, whereas the ones which, uh, uh, which cluster towards the bottom, these are kind of typical states. So uh, I mentioned that we need to restrict within a small window of energies as well as a small window of additional conserved charges. So uh, we, should, we should use this additional conserved charge it, as a filter, and we should uh, restrict ourselves to some kind of window of charges uh, between, between these, okay? where, where the uh, conserved charge is actually uh, lies within a small window. Okay, and try to look whether ETH is obeyed or not within this small window of additional conserved charges. Right? That's that's what we should be doing. So we should use this additional conserved charges as a filter and look at uh, states or having conserved charges only within this small window. Okay, so let's try to do that. So we'll only restrict to these uh, small win uh, window, and indeed, what happens is that you use this as a filter. Okay, so these are the conserved charges for your, uh, these are the values of the conserved charges. You use this as a filter only to keep the states uh, within a small window, which is this, uh, within this window. And uh, very interestingly, if you use this as a filter, then you can uh, remove these states, okay? Okay, so these were the outlier states, which you can actually remove and then you get smooth diagonal elements, all right? So um, this is quite non-trivial. It's not removing by hand. Um, uh, so it's, it's the fact that the outliers of the KDV charge, uh, they match with the outliers of the probe operator, okay? So, and it does the filtering and it gives you smooth diagonal elements, right? So, uh, um, so, uh, so as I mentioned, we need the initial uh, superposition of states. Our initial states should have a, um, uh, have a superposition of states whose, whose KDV charges lie within a small window. Otherwise that state is not going to thermalize. And indeed, if you restrict yourself to this small window of states, you get the smooth diagonal elements. Right? So uh, is this clear? Um, any questions? Uh, I have a question. Yeah. Is it like uh, uh, is is there a more like analytic understanding why why this happens? Like. Yeah, yeah. So, so uh, actually, yes. So, if you go to high descendant levels, uh, you can look at the distribution of KDV charges, and you can find the mean and the variance analytically, and then you will see that uh, the variance is actually small, and there is some finite mean. So, most of the typical states um, uh, um, have KDV charges close to each other. 
So when you're doing this KDV filtering, you are actually restricting yourself to typical states only. So uh, which can be analytically described using the quantum numbers, which I showed while comparing the stress tensors. And if you uh, restrict yourself uh, to those states, and then you're going to get uh, this curve. Yeah. yeah, that's one. Uh, that's just the statement that the fluctuations in the energy is small for the typical states. Yeah, energy that... as well as the conserved charges are small. Yes, for, for... Okay. If, if if I can make a comment over here, uh, yes, the, yeah. high, the higher level descendants uh, they act, they are getting uh, they are becoming more like typical states, and is that why? It is um, the, the diagonal elements are smooth, right? Right, 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 right. Yeah. So for low now, uh, lower level of descendants, yeah. I, I mean. Yeah, for low, low level, low this, yeah, it it is not very clear to see it it in low level descendants, but numerically, I mean, looking at high high level descendants is a numerically difficult problem to do. Yeah. So we looked at level eighteen. Or up to so on, yeah, and that was good enough to see the structure. I mean, if you yeah. look at higher levels, it just get better and better. Yeah, yeah. it should be good. It should be more. Uh, better. It should be a good, better fit yeah. to the thermal distribution. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Okay. And uh, yes, actually, Akhil, there is also an analytical understanding. I mean, one can actually find these matrix elements. I mean, in the heavy light regime. And one can see why it is smooth uh, uh, from there itself. Yeah, that's the next thing which I'm going to talk about. Yeah. Right. But if I, there are any, I have a question, sir. So, so apart from KDV, there's probably it's a stupid question to ask. But in CFT, can you define something like the W infinity kind of algebra, and then there can be other charges, right? Right, right. right. So uh, that's a good question. So, um, uh, so this KDV charges is always made out of the stress tensor normal order to the product of the stress tensor and derivatives and so on. But if you have a W algebra, this KDV hierarchy, it gets generalized to a KP hierarchy. Right, yes. And then there are even more conserved charges uh, that you can define. Yeah. Okay. But then, the, and then it becomes a slightly more involved problem. I, I haven't worked, I haven't seen anywhere the details worked out, but I also haven't done it exactly, uh, explicitly, but it becomes a more detailed problem. Uh, and, but the idea over there as well is that you have to restrict between um, a window, so a small window of charges uh, from this KP hierarchy. Right. right. Yeah. Right. Right. Um, Okay, so uh, so this is a, a slightly a more formulated version of what I was saying in words in the previous slide, is that, um, okay, so the initial state, uh, it should be a sum <clears throat> over uh, closely spaced uh, energies, sum over states with closely spaced energies, as well as closely spaced KDV charges, okay? If you, you, can, you can take like very separate KDV charges. So these are macroscopic charges, which are like very different. And then you will see the initial state which you construct is not going to obey cluster decomposition of charge charge correlation functions. So cluster decomposition is something which you would like to have in, in, in a reasonable quantum field theory. But uh, if you construct initial states with two very different uh, conserved charges, then it uh, does not obey cluster decomposition. Okay, and um, we saw that the time evolution um, is given by this. So if you have this operator, you take this initial state and it's the time evolution is, uh, is given by this. Over here, I've suppressed the additional conserved charge labels, but it's essentially this. But the ETH ansatz, uh, as I also mentioned yesterday, uh, should be generalized um, to, to keep track of the um, additional conserved charges. So the states are labeled not just by the energies, but also the quantum numbers corresponding to this additional conserved charges. And provided you restrict yourself to a small window of charges, um, this is smooth, okay? So the diagonal matrix elements, these are smooth, okay? And then there will be some uh, fluctuations. Uh, yeah, the details of that, uh, we don't know yet, at least in this case, yeah. At least yet, I mean, up to this point, yeah. Yes. Okay. So uh, I can go on. 
so um, one can actually have an analytical uh, understanding of this. Okay, so uh, we saw this structure in this matrix elements, which was clearly not a matrix, clearly not a random matrix, as ETH says. But um, there is some structure to it, and can we understand that analytically? So uh, that can be done in this regime of light probes and heavy external states. So that's what we do. So this is a light probe and a heavy external state. And you can do perturbation theory and in, in this regime, okay? So you can look at this matrix and do a one over energy expansion. So this energy is the energy of the external state, okay? So this and this, okay? And you can do a, a one over energy expansion. Okay, and these matrix elements, you can find it analytically. So these are analytical plots. So we looked at uh, what are the matrix elements that get switched on uh, at each order. So the, at the first order, we just get a diagonal matrix. Okay, and it's, it's basically an identity matrix. So this is related to Akhil's question that, uh, that why are the diagonal matrix elements smooth? So at leading order, all the uh, matrix elements are same. Okay, and then you have uh, small corrections um, uh, coming from higher orders in this one over energy expansion. Okay, and that's the reason uh, why they are like kind of uh, uh, small fluctuations about this identity matrix. That's why this happens. Okay, but anyway, you see that uh, at each other, uh, more and more off diagonal matrix elements get switched on. Okay, and also the off diagonal matrix elements, they are suppressed by one over. Uh, one over square root h. Okay, so ETH says that your off diagonal matrix elements, these are exponentially suppressed by the entropy, but over here we see a power law suppression by the energy, actually. So it's a bit different. Okay, yes, or Yes, so uh, is there anything special about this first order where there is no diagonal uh, element present in this figure? Yeah, this is a bit of detail, yeah. I cannot explain it in a few sentences. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Yeah. So this is what uh, what happens, actually. And you can take uh, these first three orders, for example, in perturbation theory, and um, yeah, you can just uh, overlap this on top of each other. So this is the analytical calculation, and then you compare it with the numerics, and uh, indeed you see. Uh, reasonable agreement, at least visually. And actually, there is an understanding of this in terms of Young diagrams. So uh, the, uh, the matrix elements which actually get switched on at each order, I mean, these ones, for example, uh, these are correspond to Young diagrams, two different Young diagrams, which differ by a row. But anything that differs by, by a row uh, actually gets switched on. And over here at the next order, any two Young diagrams that differ that differ by two rows get switched on, and then higher and higher and higher orders happens. Mm -hmm. like but by differ by rows, are you saying that box number changes? Or no, yeah, the box number changes. So it's certainly uh, off diagonal matrix elements. So it is like the box number should be different, right? Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, you have some um, Young diagram like this, and if you have any other Young diagram like this. Uh, these two um, uh, young diagrams differ by one row. And this is something that is going to get switched on in this diagram. This is the way it happens. I mean, it's a, yeah, this comes from the details of the calculation. Yeah, it's not mm -hmm. very easy to immediately understand it, but uh, this is what, what happens. These are the matrix elements that get switched on. Interesting, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so this is what we have. And uh, as I was saying, um, the off diagonal elements are suppressed by a power law in the energy. Um, this is in contrast to the ETH criterion, uh, where it says that uh, suppression should be exponential in the energy, which is this. But note that we are looking at uh, a single Verma module where there are additional symmetries. So uh, yeah, we readily don't expect the ETH handouts to be true uh, on its face. So yeah, this is kind of. However, there is suppression, uh, which is kind of, it's very important that we, uh, an important fact we realized during our previous discussions was that 
um, the, in integral systems, most of the off-diagonal elements turn out to be zero, and some of them turn out to be large. But over here, we actually see the off-diagonal elements are small, but they are non-zero. Non okay, so uh, the necessary conditions for thermalization, they are actually met. Okay, so that, that is one thing which we learned from this. Okay, and this structure is actually universal. It's true for uh, all Verma modules. Uh, um, and uh, yeah, so we looked at uh, uh, over here, these plots are for like, if the external states have got the same conformal dimension, but you can also do the same analysis if the conformal dimension is different and uh, yeah, you can find those matrix elements as well. Uh, but remember there is an overall OP coefficient, uh, which is kind of theory dependent. And, yeah, I'll talk about that uh, after this. But any questions or comments at this stage? Yeah, I have a few more. I, I think I just have two more slides and then I'll, I'll just finish. I think I'm close to my ending time, but uh, I, I don't think I'll take more than five minutes more. Yeah. But any questions at this stage? Okay. Okay, so now uh, we calculated the matrix elements in descendant states, but I kept saying that there is an overall constant, which is the OP coefficient. Uh, this is theory dependent information, but there are some universal properties we can extract by <clears throat> putting the theory, putting the CFT on various surfaces, just like the Cardi formula gave some universal feature for the spectrum of the theory. One can get uh, uh, universal properties of the OP coefficients by looking at correlation functions, see on the torus or on, on a genus two Riemann surface and, and so on, okay? So one can get some constraints on, on the OP coefficients and get some universal properties of, of averages of, of, of these OP coefficients. Okay, so this result was fixed by Virasoro symmetry, but um, there is an overall factor. And the question is like, what is this overall factor? Okay, and um, uh, so some averages of these matrix elements can actually be calculated. And uh, um, so these, these, as I was saying, is calculated say, by looking at a two-point function uh, on a torus, for example, or you can look at the genus two partition function uh, or the four-point function on the plane and uh, impose crossing symmetry. And then from, from using uh, these properties of crossing symmetry and modular invariance and so on, one can get some results for uh, these uh, averages of OP coefficients. And uh, the, the paper had, that, has, that actually summarizes all of this and gives a unified description uh, for what these averages should be is, uh, uh, is, is by, this, uh, by these authors. Okay? It was actually started by some work by Krauss and Maloney and uh, there were some papers in between, and I had also actually worked on this, but uh, I think the uh, final and the best description of these things was uh, provided by these, these people. Okay, so one can actually look at the um, light, light, heavy coefficient. So the um, conformal dimensions of this op these two operators are small, while the conformal dimension of this operator is large. Okay, and then we see that it disobeys this kind of a formula. Uh, recall that your Cardi's formula was S is equal to four pi uh, divided by C uh, E probably by six or something, but some number, okay? But essentially what you see over here, this factor is like the entropy, okay? Similarly over here, this factor is also like the entropy and then this factor is also like the entropy. Okay, uh, of interest to ETH is actually this one. So this is like, if you have a light, heavy, heavy, so there is associativity, so you can just swap things around. So this is like heavy, light, heavy. So it's like a light probe operator in two heavy finite energy density states. Okay, this is like ETH. So we see over here that there is an exponential suppression. Okay, so this is actually E to the minus S something like ETH predicts, okay? We see that the average indeed has got an, an exponential suppression by the entropy, which is, which is actually this. 
Okay, um, so these are the results for the averages. Um, um, at least the averages uh, give something consistent with the ETH ansatz, but you know, looking at averages is not enough. Well, when you prepare an initial state, you need more fine-grained information about individual OP coefficients. Okay, so, and that's and this is like two two universal data, and then uh, like you know, you don't expect universality uh, in, to like play a role in thermalization. One has to look at some kind of specifics of a chaotic CFT and then see what features it has. Okay, so we need information about the individual OP coefficients. And uh, yeah, so this is the Cardi entropy, which is also the black hole entropy. And then these things are actually suppressed by the entropy. Okay, so we need um, mm, information about the individual OP coefficients. And uh, one uh, plausible idea, which was uh, uh, mentioned in that paper by Collier, Maloney, and others, is that uh, uh, for chaotic CFTs, these results are true even without averaging. Okay, so imagine, so you when you're averaging, you're averaging over a small window of states, okay, with some energies. What the proposal is that these results are even true for chaotic CFTs. These results are true even if you take this uh, width of this window to be zero, okay? So kind of, it it's kind of says that for, for even for individual um, states, um, individual OP coefficients, this something like this is true. That, that's what the proposal is. Like it's, it's yet to be made fully concrete, but uh, that's kind of an idea, which is kind of, which is plausible. Okay, so, um, but ETH tells you that uh, these of diagonal elements, they should have some random feature built into it. Uh, unfortunately, at this stage, uh, as of today, it's not clear like how this randomness enters in this um, P coefficients. Okay, so it's still an open question. And uh, there has been some recent proposals which uh, which actually propose uh, that the P coefficients uh, should obey some ansatz like ETH. But actually, it's uh, far from clear whether um, it it actually forms the data of a consistent CFT. It's re it still remains to be checked whether uh, you know the constraints coming from bootstrap, like for example, crossing symmetry and modular invariance and so on, whether all of these are obeyed by an ETH-like ansatz for the OP coefficients. Yeah, so that's that remains something open and uh, more work needs to be done. But once this is done, we can have a better idea of what the data is of a, um, you know, of a CFT, which is thermalizing. And that will be also be closely related to, uh, to the holographic dual of, of a, say like a classical theory with black holes in, in the bulk. Okay, all right. So that's all I have to say. So I'm going to end here. Thanks. Thanks everyone for your attention. There are any questions? Just thanks. It was very nice. Thanks. Yes. Okay. No. So did, did you say once you once you have the sunsets for how the OP coefficient scales? Like uh, I didn't catch this point. Does it improve the improve the uh, heavy uh, light heavy heavy perturbation theory you had like? In one by energies. The, ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because this comes as an overall factor. Yes, that's kind of improves. So you have an overall. The OP coefficient is is uh, is is an overall factor compared to what we already computed, which was the, in which the off diagonal elements were power loss suppressed. Oh, so the, so the the ETH ETH uh, and such like suppression really comes from the OP coefficient itself, like not from the block kind so of argument. That's the proposal. I mean, it remains to be checked. I mean, for example, you can you you can mention anything about OP coefficient. You can declare that this something like this can be true, but uh, it has to obey the crossing equations, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, that has not been carried out uh, today, uh, as of today. Yeah. Oh, so I was kind of slightly like maybe I misunderstood the philosophy of this slide. This like, this this slide was kind of saying that, uh, but I, I also thought this slide was kind of motivating and separate each kind of program for the OP coefficients. 
what what yeah w- what i tried to say over here is like is that i mean something like the eth ansatz can be true for op coefficients you can propose something like that but whether such a thing is true or not remains to be verified Yeah, by the way, just as a side comment, like some of these plots are really nice. I guess you should really print out that T-shirt with the checkered pattern and so on. Yeah, when when we actually got this plot, I mean, the you know, and I sent it to Pear, and he said that I I I, I want a T-shirt with this plot on it. Yeah, like some of these branchings, like with this light blue and white background, they're like kind of the, like kind of like these Japanese woodblock prints. Where there is a snow tree over the snow and so on. Sorry to yeah interrupt. If you get any T-shirt printed like that, let us know. Maybe you get some bias over here. Okay, any further questions? At least we can stop. Okay, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, so uh, the thing that you were talking about yesterday, I have a little confusion about that. So this generalized Gibson symbol uh, yeah, that yeah. you were talking about, and there also you mentioned this uh, presence of uh, more than, yeah. more number of conserved charges and so on, right? Right, I, right. I'm just a little uh, confused about the quantum Newton's cradle uh, thing that you were mentioning related to that. In that case, it retains the memory of the initial system. So it is yes, supposed yes. to be integrable and not chaotic. So what is the statement regarding Gibson symbol, uh, generalized Gibson symbol relating to that? Yeah, 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 yeah. So it's, it, this, this is this statement, which I try to say over here, okay? So let's look at the quantum Newton's cradle. I mean, it can be um, realized as a 1D Bose gas and which has got an infinite number of uh, conserved uh, quantities, okay? Now in the generalized Gibbs ensemble, okay, first statement you can say is that the system relaxes to the generalized Gibbs ensemble, but relaxes in quotes because it never actually relaxes. Now, um, what that means is that, uh, uh, so the initial state fixes for you the temperature and it also fixes for you all the chemical potentials. Okay, so that, that the initial state gives you this information. Now, okay, the system evolves. Okay, and then you say at later times, it relaxes to this ensemble. But uh, the idea is that um, now that you know the information about these chemical potentials, you can use this information to reconstruct the initial state. So the memory of the initial state is not lost. So, mm-hmm. so the memory uh, is get stored by this chemical potential. So these chemical potentials, since there are an infinite number of them, it's kind of acts as a storage device to like store the information about the initial state. So it remains. And yeah, that, that's, that's how uh, the explanation goes. But you would still require like a order entropy conserved charges to really reproduce the initial state, right? Yeah, here it's infinite. Yeah, actually, yeah, I think because it, it, it it's infinite, but like even as a comparison among infinites, like yeah, yeah, yes. I mean, so so that okay. Let let's see. So so in is your initial state say it can be a you obviously want to keep the um, uh, superposition within a small window of energies and conserved charges so there will be some number of states yes i mean that would grow as e to the s yeah you can that that can be the that number of states in the superposition yeah and only if you have e to the s number of conserved currents then you have that many chemical potentials and you can that use that information to reconstruct the coefficients entering in the linear combination. Yes, that is that is that is correct. Yes. Yeah. Yes, uh, So, so you have constructed the uh, uh, 
a typical state and and you you have checked the eth uh, for uh, stress tensor right i mean for any right, right. yeah. so right. so my question is uh, can you i mean uh, uh, I mean, can you uh, check these answers for any uh, other operators, like pri any primary operators inside yeah, those, those typical states? I mean. Yeah, that that's what I discussed in the second part, right? Yeah, so I, mean, I, the non I mean the non-diagonal part. I mean. Yeah, yeah. Also the non-diagonal parts. That's what these uh, matrices are about. Okay, so uh, maybe I, I'll say this again. So this is this is a primary okay, okay. yeah yes. for and, then, and, and yeah. this issue are the, those those states right i mean those those typical states all so here we are doing numerics we are looking at all possible things okay? yeah uh, it's all you know just across up to level 12 we look look at all possible descendants up to level 12 and yeah and then we just look at the matrix elements yes yeah so this is precisely what you're asking yeah, yeah, yeah. okay a single one and then looking at I mean, these are those typical states, right? I mean, those you have constant, like by maximizing those row, I mean, this no, no, the no. density of. Here I have, um, so for the typical states, I said that this is uh, given by this Bose Einstein distribution. But here it is anything. Yeah. Oh, but but I, I, I was asking for the previous, uh, previous, uh, where you have constructed the, by, by maximizing this row, I mean, the typical yeah, yeah, okay, okay, okay. Yes, oh, so okay. that would correspond to a subset of this matrix. Oh, okay, okay. Oh, but okay. that information already exists over here. Yeah. Okay, yeah. okay. okay. I mean, we could not go to like very high levels. I mean, I think in this plot I've shown up to level 12, but I think uh, in the paper uh, we went up to level 13 or so. But uh, I mean, that's with the computational resources we had. I mean, oh. We had to use a cluster to do this calculation. I mean, you can formulate this matrix elements as some uh, linear equations, and then you have to solve this linear equations. And okay. yeah, it could go up to level 15. Yeah. So this for, I mean, for one operator, OH, I mean, for one probe right. operator. Right, right. Yeah. But, but you can, you, but this is uh, kind of, in a sense, in principle, this is enough information for uh, mm -hmm. uh, like additional operators also, because you can insert a complete set of states, right? Mm -hmm. And yeah. then, yeah, you can again. The, these, this is yes, yes. this is going to enter again. So yeah, so this is the most basic. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, but in the in the right hand side for this, I mean the for the uh, thermal ensemble, the OH, the expression value OH, that that is zero, right? I mean for as as. Yeah, I mean, that is true. Yeah. That, that is yeah. That yeah is zero. But, but if if you take two 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 OH, then it could be some non-zero. I mean. Yeah. 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 I mean that is exactly solvable from the and the RHS is exactly I mean no, right? No. right. The diagonal, yeah, yeah, yes, exactly. yes, yes. But the LHS is uh, okay. 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 I mean, I mean, just uh, can can we I mean use this as a bootstrap equation or something? I mean, for yeah. yeah, yeah. So so the thing is like so uh, so this this information actually enters your conformal block if you write. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Because you know, in the conformal block, you uh, you take two, uh, you know, you again insert a complete set of states, mm -hmm. and on one side you don't have this; actually, you just have the primary. But yes. you basically sum over all possible states of this kind uh, in when you insert the resolution of the identity. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So this information actually enters the conformal block. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And, but this is more information than the conformal block. Uh, mm. Also in the conformal block, I mean, the, at a given level, the contribution from all descendants, they come added up. But this is more fine grained. Uh, here we are separating between each individual integer partition and we yes. have the information for each single descendant. Yeah. Oh, thanks, thanks, thanks. Yes, uh, Rohit. Uh, my, my question is uh, where you have uh, calculated the uh, power loss of trace uh, yeah. term, like yeah. So uh, if you could go to higher powers, would that would it be possible to uh, get back the exponential suppression that <coughs> that ETH suggests? You mean you want to do some kind of resummation of this? Yeah, one upon lambda lambda v, then one upon lambda v squared, then lambda u squared, then one upon lambda. Well, exponential suppression is always stronger than any kind of power law, right? I mean, that's, uh, yeah. Yeah. 
I was I was thinking that if you could just extend it to a higher power and maybe see. Yeah, you can. Yeah, you can do it systematically to higher orders. But you know, this is this is all overall. I mean, so it was always going to remain in the series expansion. It's always going to remain power loss oppression. So, yeah. But, yeah. But but you see, I mean, um, in, a, in a sense, like numerics gives you the answer more directly because here, there we are not doing perturbation theory. That's not the yeah. And There you can, yeah, you can take the ratio and then see that the off diagonal elements, they are at least power loss suppressed. Yeah. Maybe we can stop the recording. So 